Hi everyone, it's Julie Johnson. Um, I had a little um, technology snafu um, this morning, so I'm just doing this, um, recording this, um, just through um, through my phone. <laughs> so it's not live, but um, we'll like do. So um, today I'm I'm talking about embodied parenting and uh, embodied parenting skills um, <clears throat> through the embodied this embodied parenting and teaching um, series. That I I'm doing over the next three weeks. Um, so this morning I'm talking about embodied parenting, which a lot of this stuff is stuff we've probably heard and posted about in Integrate, but I wanted to just go over some of the skills that um, I use as a parent and a teacher. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Julie Johnson. I am a, I am a um, a trauma-informed special ed teacher and a, a, a mom, <laughs> so um, this is something that I use quite a bit um, in my own practice um, and in my own self-care. So, um, oh, and I also organize a um, trauma-informed and um, adaptive yoga program with um, Tasha Babler and Bonnie Lyons called Fidelity of Yoga. So these are things that we use in our practice and also in my parenting. So, okay, so um, embodied parenting. So um, last night was a little bit of a embodied parenting moment for us too. <laughs> um, we, we have, we've kind of all been shut in for the last couple of days. Um, half of our family has been sick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Half of our family has been sick. So it's been a little bit crazy. Um, so what I was saying was, is, um, We've, I've been using these techniques over the last uh, couple of days, so um, they're fresh <laughs> in my in my head. Um, okay, so the idea of embodied parenting starts with us as the parents, and this is stuff that Dan Siegel says, and Kelly Call is also talking about it right, when she has talked with us um, <clears throat> or been live with us on Facebook in the past. Um, but if we're going to be teaching our children how to be grounded in their nervous systems and be grounded in their bodies um, and, and therefore in the world around them, it starts with us modeling that. And that's called um, mirror neurons, okay? And um, a mirror neuron is a, is a neuron that fires, um, that fires both when an animal acts and when the animal observes the same action performed by another. Thus, the, the neurons are mirrored. The behavior of the other as though the observer were acting as itself. Such, the neurons have been directly observed in a primate species. So that's the parent-child relationship. The kids are picking up the, behavior, the behaviors of the parents. So <clears throat> it puts a lot of um, responsibility on us to act out the behaviors that we want to instill in our kids, okay? Um, as Dan Siegel says, um, my Dan Siegel quote, where did it go? Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, apparently I didn't put it. But anyway, Dan, I had a Dan Siegel quote, but it's not there. Anyway, Dan Siegel, um, is awesome. He has written several books on parenting, um, children, uh, with, <clears throat> called, um, The Whole Brain Child. And another book that I'm going to recommend that I pulled some of these ideas from, is the uh, Trauma Proofing Your Kids by Dan Siegel and Ma Maggie Klein, which is an amazing book. And some of these ideas I have, that have worked for me in my parenting have also um, helped. And I'll be referring to those um, several times throughout the series. Um, excuse me. One second. I've got a other words. Okay. All right. Um, oh, here's my Dan Siegel quote. I just found it. Okay. So all children, okay, as children develop, their brains mirror their parents' brain. In other words, the parent's own growth and development or lack of those impacts the child's brain. As parents become more aware and emotionally healthy, their, ch their children reap the rewards and move forward as well. Okay, so again, <clears throat> when we, that's just receiving the mirror neurons, but in a more, like, whatever, um, in a more... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, oh, it's early. Um, kind of just not scientific way. Anyway, okay. So the components 
the components that I see as embodied parenting, um, which are also the same as teaching or interacting with kids, is that um, the parents are witnessing rather than analyzing the child's behavior, okay? So, um, so we're, anal we're, we're watching our, our kids as they are moving through the world and we're, um, we're not saying, um, oh, that's bad or, oh, that behavior is bad or, oh, that's, you know, you're not, you're not labeling things for them. You're just noticing it. Like this morning, for example, my daughter, as I was getting up to do this, this presentation, my daughter, it was angry that I wouldn't let her out of bed. And so she said, mommy, that just makes me mad. Shut up. <laughs> you know? And I said, oh, those, um, <coughs> I hear a lot of emotional words coming out of your mouth. Is that how you, is that how you feel right now? You know, and so I'm just, it's a practice of constantly questioning her. And not like, in a bad way, not like, you know like interrogative way, but just making her aware of the words she's coming out of her mouth and, and being able to like prompt her to go inward, okay, and assess what's happening in her inner world. Instead of saying, oh, that's emotional. You know, um, it's those sound, you know, those words sound um, emotional. Is that sound or sound strong? Is, do, do you have a lot of strong sensations in your body? You know, and we, we've been through some of this stuff. So um, I just sort of con in, in prompting her to go inward, okay? Um, now, she's seven, so it's a little bit, um, we've been at this for a little while. Um, my, my barely five-year-old, it, it's a little bit different. Um, but, but like I said, we're, we're a witness and not a, um, yes. <laughs> um, Anyway, we're a witness and not an analyst, okay? We're not labeling people's behaviors. We're not saying that's bad or that's bad or, or um, that's good, that's bad. You know, you're letting them, you're prompting them to, to be aware of themselves, that they are a body and a person in space and they have control over their world, okay? By prompting those um, inner um, questions, you know? Um, just by say, just by asking a question. Um, for older kids, for example, my daughter has been asking, and her some of her older friends have been asking more about um, body parts. You know, like um, genitals and you know, and uh, boobs and penises. Recently, you know, uh, as though they're at an age where they're noticing that stuff. You know, and so I have been, which those things come up instead of. Um, putting my own spin on it, I've been saying, oh, what does that mean to you? What is that? What is, can you say the word, um, well, you know, when you hear people say boyfriend, girlfriend, what do those words mean to you? I don't know. Okay. What does love mean to you when you, when you hear people say that they, uh, you know, your friends say that they're boyfriend and girlfriend, what do those words mean to you? You know, that they're in love, I think. Oh, okay. What does love mean to you? As, as a seven-year-old, you know, and so I'm not giving her answers. I'm just questioning. Janine, her. I will have, I mean, I will have conversations where we will guide like what a healthy platonic relationship or platonic or romantic relationship looks like down the road. But at seven, I'm just prompting her to explore what's happening inside of herself as she says these kinds of adult concepts that she doesn't really have an understanding of. Okay. Um, but it's just prompting that internal investigation so she um isn't just spouting what people say to her she's actually thinking through what does that mean what hmm what does boyfriend and girlfriend mean at, you know age seven and um you know just that just having an open um conversation of questioning and, um and exploring, okay, um, between us, just that communication of, of exploring without judgment, without judgment. And sometimes you have to put on a little bit, especially when you get into those, like, oh my gosh, when she started asking about, <laughs> Nick, 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 she asked about, about, um, about, um, she asked me about naked yoga a couple weeks ago, and I just, I had to put on, like, my stoic face, and I was like, what is, what is that, 
what does that mean? Like, she just, like, brings this sword naked and then whatever she can put in front of it because she's, she's interested and she's at that age where she's exploring, you know, what these adult concepts are. So um, you just kind of have to put on your, your stoic face and just, you're, without judgment, and you, what does that mean? Hmm, that's, that's, a, that's interesting. Where did you hear that? I, hmm, you're really asking good questions, you know, without judgment. So we don't want to shield our kids from, um, from the world. We want to make, make them curious um, and, and guide them through that curiosity. So, and keeping that and fostering that relationship between us, because it's not the thing that, we, that we're trying to do that. We're trying to keep that relationship between the parent and, and the child um, uh, safe and um, a safe space to explore the way the world works. Um, while that we're also helping them come up with their own worldview and go inward. So um, that's a little bit about the um, being a witness rather than an analyst. Um, and using the open-ended questions, I kind of said that. Um, you know, keep asking with prompts. Oh, that's really interesting. How does that mean to you? What is, um, you, know, what do, you know, what do you think that means? Or how did that feel in your body? How does that make your, um, you know, where do you feel that emotion in your body? And I'll get to some strategies on how to help tap into those questions because sometimes kids don't know if that hasn't been a practice. But, um, or, 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 you know, if they, feel, if they feel sad, hmm, where do you, you know, what part of your body do you, you feel sadness in when, you, when these sad things happen to you or you talk about sadness? Um, let's see here, uh, which would actually happen in our family this week when our baby kid died. <laughs> Um, okay, so how do we tap into these things, okay, um, while we're being guided? Oh, where's my daughter's watch? Hold on. <coughs> so a couple of strategies that I've used to help tap in is using this lovely, I might have to move it around a little bit, um, chart. Oh, it's a polyvagal theory chart with Winnie the Pooh characters on it. Um, you've got Eeyore up here, who represents the, um, I guess that would be the shutdown or the freeze zone. You've got Tigger, or that would be the parasympathetic nervous system right here, the dorsal vagal. You've got Tigger, who represents the sympathetic nervous system. And you've got Pooh over here, who represents the social engagement, okay? And this is sort of how the chart that me and my kids use to help um, um, map out how they feel in their bodies or how their energy level feels in their bodies based off what's happened to them, okay? This is how we start, okay? And if Winnie the Pooh is a reference for us because it's well-known um, and they can easily refer to it. So I'll be like, where, you know, like our guinea pig died um, on Thursday and I asked Shyla, <coughs> Where do you where do you feel um, where do you feel like Eeyore in your body, you know? And she just felt sort of low and in her like in her chest and and then um, you know yeah last night, which is why I couldn't do last night, go live last night. You know where do you? I asked her where she felt um, where she felt um, like Tigger in her body or or where she felt anxious in her body. I asked her who she felt like. Did she feel more like um, I knew it was Tigger, but I just wanted her to analyze. <laughs> um, I wanted her to see because I mean sometimes you could feel like poo and look like just look more openly engaged. I didn't want to judge it, but I had a feeling it was going to be bigger just based off of the way she was um, responding. She um, we asked I asked her how she was feeling um, about going to bed last night, and she just she felt like tigger. She felt really anxious, and so which means we have to go through our whole little um, self calming routine. So, but she could communicate that to me that she was she was in the red zone, that she was in the sympathetic nervous system. So she said tigger. So I knew that means that we needed to do the things we need to do, which is like breathing and just counting backwards and doing our our mindfulness activities to get us into the social engagement space, so she could go to sleep. Okay. Um, anyway, this is a really good tool to use um, when you're um, teaching kids first how to even engage with the uh, with with where they are in their bodies. Are they in a freeze zone? They feel shut down and numb. Are they in a fight, a flight uh, phase? Or are they social, in an open and socially engaged space? Are they, are they are they ready to engage with people like Winnie the Pooh? Or are we still a tigger, <laughs> you know? 
So anyway, this is just a good way to get them mindfully aware of it. I mean, you can use Sesame Street characters, you know, um, this was just relevant to my family, but you could use, um, you know, who would be, you know, Oscar the Grouch might be in the freeze zone. And then Big Bird might be in the social engagement zone. And then, you know, um, Elmo, you know, might be the freeze or the, the sympathetic nervous system ticker. So anyway, that's just an example, but those are all like using pop culture symbols to represent the freeze zone, the different zones of engagement um, is really helpful to us. So anyway, that is mine. I will post mine also um, in uh, this morning as well. So that, um, so you guys can print this off if you want it. So I can just take a screenshot um, of this. Um, Another thing that we do, and this is an idea from the um, <coughs> from the uh, trauma proofing your kids book. So um, their learning language, how do you tap into their bodies? Is we created a somatic box, okay? And we wrote down words that were in the trauma proofing your kids book, and we put in um, we wrote like the words heavy. We wrote the words silky <laughs> and all these other words and I mean just all these different words that you, one could use to describe how they feel in their bodies um I don't know what that word says learning I don't know she makes up words sometimes and that's okay too weak um cool <laughs> so she wrote them all down um she wrote them all down and then put them in this little box so <coughs> um and then what happens is, is what we, we play the body sensation word game. So we pull out a thing and we're like, oh, and we, I read a book and we talk to each other. Um, okay, what part of your body, you know, my word's cool. And so I look inside of my body and I like, is there any part of my body that feels cold right now or cool? And then I, and then I shut my, you don't have to shut your eyes. I sort of just do this like 30 seconds and I analyze where we feel in our body. Um, and I feel like, oh, I feel cool in my toes. Okay, well, that was my turn. Okay. And then it's just a really fun way to engage the language somatic um, uh, sensations. So just, just noticing, you know, like, then she'll do it. So it's a give and take game. And then my son, who's just starting to kind of get into this, is starting to do it too. So where, you know, where is there, and, and there might, there may not be a part of your body that feels like the word that's associated on it. And that's okay. It's just that you're noticing it and you're making the noticing um, a practice and you're going inward and you're doing that inward prompting to go in and notice sensations in your body and how, and having them and teaching the kids how they associate to language. So that's like a huge piece of embodied parenting is using, is bringing that language and those body sensations together in a number of capacities. So um, I'll have more tips to share next week. Um, but another book I would say besides the trauma, um, proofing your child that I would say is also this book, the, um, trauma informed practice with children and adolescents is awesome as well and has some really good tips. Um, oh, and the other thing I was going to say that's huge about, um, children, especially with that, with those questioning and the different things is follow their, let them follow their pace. Um, Notice the children's pacing. Don't speed up their process to where you're at. And you, I mean, because you're an adult, you're going to be able, might get this a lot quicker or not. You know, they might get it quicker. I don't know. But anyway, the point is follow their lead on pacing with these questions and with the with, with anything. If they're done, let them be done with with the with any activity like this. Or you know, listen to them. If they're done, be done. Okay, or change change it. Um, also. Um, when you're doing these kinds of activities, the uh, the word thing, never say a sensation is good or bad. I we, we say pleasant or unpleasant. Like feeling numb in your body, feeling weak in my body is unpleasant. Okay, um, but don't say good or bad. Just say pleasant or unpleasant. You know, I think it's good or bad just has too many negative connotations. Like I can't feel that it's bad. Yeah, you because know, then we like internalize it as a bad person. So we say pleasant or unpleasant. Okay. Um, anyway, um, that is it. I will be sharing this.
up quickly and um, I'll have more ideas next week. Have a good one, everyone. Bye. Thank you.